Welcome to the History Nerd United Podcast. I'm your head nerd, Brendan. Thank you so much for being here. Today, very special book, Tori Olson and his book, Red Dead's History. If you've not heard of Red Dead Redemption 2, that's what this book is about. It's a video game. It's a Western. It's acclaimed as one of the greatest of all time for a lot of wonderful reasons. One that we are really talking about today with Tori and in his book is the fact that the history is amazing in it. There is a lot of detail a lot of stories in here that are pulled directly from history. Names are changed here and there. But we actually dive into it with Tori about all of the things that they get right and the things that they get wrong. One other thing about this, and if you've played the game, you're going to love this. I don't necessarily recommend audiobooks all the time. I love to hold that book in my hand and read it. But the audiobook for Red Dead's history is narrated by Roger Clark. Roger Clark is the main character in the game named Arthur Morgan. He is the voice actor. He does the audiobook in character as he reads it. I've listened to a snippet of it. It's absolutely amazing and just completely nerded out on it. So let's talk to Tori so you can hear more about it. If you haven't played the game, why don't you download it while you're listening to the podcast? I think that's the best way to do it. Let me shut up. Let's talk to Tori. And here we are with author Tori Olson, Red Dead's History, a Video Game, an Obsession, and America's Violent Past. Tori, thank you so much for coming on. Hey, uh, thanks so much, Brendan. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, Tori, I'm going to jump ahead, right? Because somebody might be turning this on and say, dude's writing a book about a video game. Clearly, he lives in his parents' basement and just plays video games. Could you do me a favor and just let the listeners know, what's your actual day job? Yeah, so my title uh, formally is I'm an associate professor of history and the director of graduate studies in the history department at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. So I'm a history professor at a big university. That's, you know, a serious day job. (laughs) This is a big thing. You say this in the book, and I want to start off with this. Being into history, you, you know, being the whole nine yards and then me just reading so much of it, being a historian can really ruin your enjoyment of pop culture, can't it? Yeah, it's, you know, (laughs) I don't have high expectations when pop culture tries to do history, especially American history, the period that I know well. I just, you know, I've read so much in this field that I'm very uh, sensitive to the sort of recycling of cliches and stereotypes and, uh, you know, the kind of tired expectations that people sometimes have of the past, which really don't map onto what actually happened. And this is what it comes to with with the book, is that Red Dead Redemption 2, there's two other video games, but we mostly deal with Red Dead Redemption 2. On a scale of, um, I'm going to say Mel Gibson on one side, who butchers history on a consistent basis, and actual, real, pretty good history. Where does Red Dead Redemption 2 fall on that? Closer to the scholarly side than to Mel Gibson, I would say. It's pretty close to the middle, but it's closer to that serious side than than to the bad side, to be sure. And I wasn't expecting that. You know, when I first picked up this game back in the days of the pandemic, I was expecting pretty bad things. <laughs> uh, just because I was familiar with some of Rockstar's products from back in the 90s, the early Grand Theft Auto games. And, you know, I knew how popular uh, Red Dead Redemption 2 was. And usually things that are very popular are not very good history, unfortunately. Now, we established your history nerd cred, but I also want to make sure. How many hours do you think you spent on Red Dead Redemption 2? Because I do want to set the video game nerd cred as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I played through Steam on my PC, so it counts very accurately how long I've spent in the game, and it is just at about 200 hours. So uh, I've gone through three playthroughs, uh, played this, the main storyline and almost all the side content three times through. So 200 hours, you know, like when I tell my colleagues in the history department that, they're like, wow, how could you ever spend so much time on something? But then when I tell serious gamers, they're like, oh, you're just kind of like, you know, scratching the surface because <laughs> there's a lot of people who've played that game a lot longer than me. But I feel like I've played enough to speak as a authority of sorts uh, on the game and its storyline. <laughs> All right, now we've established those two things, but writing a book on a video game that's based in history, I have not seen this before. Where did you even get this idea to put these two things together in a book? 
Yeah, well, well, it comes out of my own personal history that even historians have history themselves. Uh, and I can't really separate the sort of origins of this book from that story. So when I was in high school, this was about 25 years ago in the late 90s, I was a huge video gamer, like really bad, addicted, obsessive gamer. Uh, this was the kind of golden age of PC gaming and titles like Half-Life and Warcraft and Starcraft and Quake and all the rest were all coming out and they just dominated my life. Like all I wanted to do was sit inside with my WASD and mouse, you know, uh, set up in front of me and play games. And it did me no favors in terms of my social scene. And it did me no favors academically either. So I was a pretty poor high school student uh, I would say, I'm surprised I even got into university. <laughs> but when I did get into college uh, in 2000, I made the fateful decision to quit gaming pretty much cold turkey. Like I realized that I was not going to succeed in a college environment if I kept on playing Quake all day. That was just not going to do it for me. <laughs> so I decided to quit and devoted myself really seriously to school, fell in love with history in particular. And for seriously, like the next 20 years, <laughs> I quit. Like I didn't look back. I went a full two decades playing very, very, very little video games. I mean, you could count, you know, I maybe I played five hours of games in that 20 year period. <laughs> I did not have any gaming hardware or anything like that. I was in graduate school, you know, I was earning my PhD, I was writing a dissertation, uh, and then I started as a junior professor at the University of Tennessee, where I teach, and there was very little time in my schedule for playing games. Uh, so I really, you know, took two decades off, which is quite a long time when it comes to video game history. But then everything kind of changed in March of 2020, a fateful month when COVID-19 arrived. And at that moment, I was much more established professionally. I'd earned tenure here at uh, UT. And I was, of course, spending a lot of time indoors because it was COVID lockdown times. And at that moment, I decided to kind of listen to that little devil on my shoulder who'd been, you know, bugging me over the last few years saying, you know, hey, why don't you try getting a gaming PC again? You know, what, what do games look like at this point? This devil, you know, had appeared once in a while over the two decades that I had taken time off. But I, I brushed him aside, you know, and proceeded with my professional life. But in March 2020, I couldn't brush him aside any longer. So I decided to splurge and buy a gaming PC. I was able to snap one up before they all disappeared at that moment. And I dipped my toes back into video games. And one of the very first games that I played was Red Dead Redemption 2. And what's funny is that I really did not pick that game up because I heard it was a good history game. I heard that it had really good graphics. That's really what made me pick it up. That was correct. It has insane graphics, especially when you compare it to what I saw in 1999, you know, the last time I was seriously playing. I kind of came for the graphics and I stayed for the history uh, because soon after you begin playing the game, I mean, you can't get five minutes into it before you learn that, oh, you know, even though the names of people and places are fictionalized in this game, Rockstar, the developer, really wanted to try to capture and say something about turn of the century United States history, right? 1899 is when Red Dead 2 is set. And uh, it wasn't long into my playthrough that I became quite impressed at the ways that the game would try to gesture toward some of the biggest dilemmas that uh, historians emphasize when they study the kind of what we call the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, you know, the kind of 30, 40 years after the Civil War. And it was about, I'd say, 15 hours into my playthrough that a big idea hit me. <laughs> it was as we were moving out of the West in the storyline and into the Deep South that I really grew intrigued at, you know, wow, this game is, you know, doing a lot of things right. I mean, there's problems, and I'm sure we'll get a chance to talk about this. There's a lot of ways that they distort and, you know, sensationalize and fictionalize the past, and it's way too violent, to be sure. But I was consistently impressed at how often the game was was gesturing toward those big ideas. And once it got into the South, and I will confess, I'm trained primarily as a Southern historian. Uh, I do a lot of Western history as well, to be sure. But now that the game was kind of squarely in the South for so many hours of the playthrough, I couldn't help myself, you know, because this is a period that I know so well, uh, an area that I know so well. The big idea struck me, which was, well, why not try teaching a class that uses this fictional, incredibly popular game 
as a way to get students excited about grappling with some of those big dilemmas that are kind of on the sidelines of the game's plot. So basically the idea of the class would be, you know, it's not a Red Dead fan club by any means. And I would never examine students on their knowledge of the games. You know, there's no multiple choice questions like who's a member of the Vanderland gang? No, that's not what I'm there for. But it's basically to use the enthusiasm and passion that the game has created in so many millions of people to actually explore that time period and see, you know, what does the game get right? Uh, what does it get wrong? But more importantly, what does it not even try to capture at all? I mean, what's the context? What's the sort of bigger picture that is causing some of the violence and unease and uh, chaos that really did define many parts of the United States in the late 19th century. So do a class, right? I mean, I'm a teacher, you know, this is like the first instinct that, that hits me. Well, hold on. I want to, I do want to ask this, right? Because a lot of us don't know how colleges work. Who is the first person that you have to go to and say, I'm going to do a history class based on a video game? How does that conversation go? So first off, even though this was the first class on a video game in my department at my university, there have been other historians across the country and world who've tried to do this. Never before for Red Dead Redemption 2, I should note. I was the first to do that. But there's also several people, myself included, in, in my department who teach using pop culture, right? So like when I teach the American History Survey, the sort of big class, I actually call it American History in 30 Pop Songs. And we listen to one song every single lecture, you know? Uh, so I've used pop culture in the classroom. But you're right that there is something a little different and unusual about using video games so centrally in framing a class. So what I had to do, Brendan, is I had to ask for permission. <laughs> and the two people I went to were the my two hires up in the history department, the department head and the associate head, who's responsible for undergraduate teaching. And I pitched them on the idea. I remember I wrote this like long email. I think I was a little anxious when I was doing it because I thought that, you know, maybe I'd get denied. But I was basically like, here's this incredibly popular game which is fictional, which gets a lot of things wrong, to be sure, but which is ultimately not stupid and which is quite thoughtful on, on many topics. And either way, it could be a very powerful way to get undergraduate students excited about, you know, talking about real history. The response from my hires up was uh, the same from both of them. They first said, I have no idea what Red Dead Redemption 2 is. <laughs> right? They're not gamers. Most professional historians are not, uh, which is totally fine. And then they said, sure, go ahead and go for it. You know, if you think students are going to sign up, they weren't sure about that. Uh, if you think students are going to sign up, we know you're going to do a serious job with it. You know, we know you're not going to blow this off and make it fan club. Go ahead, give it a shot. You know, so I had to try to prove to them that I could draw students in. And this was in 2021. So remember that this is like pandemic times still. So I knew that, you know, putting up flyers on campus was not going to be an effective way to get the word out. So I took to social media and I posted about it on Twitter and on Reddit and it blew up, <laughs> right? Like my only goal was to like spread the word among UT students, but that's not what happened. Like it, the word got spread among like a lot of people. The gaming media picked it up. GameSpot ran a story on the class. Smithsonian Magazine uh, did a small piece on the class. So we got a lot of publicity at that moment which was great because it had local consequences here at the university in that suddenly the waiting list for my class, you know, swelled up, <laughs> right? There were a lot of people who signed up that first semester. Uh, we had to really kind of shut the door at 60 students, which is much higher than a class of this type would have been usually. And we had a waiting list, you know, we had to turn people down. We just didn't have enough seats. We didn't have enough teaching assistants to help me do the grading. So there were kind of hard limits on who we could allow in that first semester. So I was able to prove to my hires up uh, in the history department that, yeah, there actually is student interest uh, in that. So this was all born out of this experimental class that I ran for the first time in the fall of 2021. And that's really what inspired me to think about writing a book as well. Uh, in part because, you know, I said I'm a teacher, right? I teach, that's what I do. Well, I'm also a writer. I'm an author. This is not my first book. I've written another book previously. Uh, and a big part of my job as a scholar at a research university is writing history books. So I thought, you know, I've got the bare bones of a book here. I've got a kind of rough draft from all the lectures and activities that we did in class. Why not convert it into an accessible, engaging book for regular people, right? Not just for students, but for gamers and history buffs and 
people around the world who are fascinated either with Red Dead Redemption 2 or with just the ways that pop culture can be used to understand the past. So that was the basic idea. <laughs> and a lot of, I should say too, Brendan, a lot of this was motivated, the idea about the, behind the book was motivated by messages that I'd gotten from people on the internet after that uh, news story about my class went viral. Uh, and then I got messages from dozens and dozens of people saying, hey, how can I participate in this class? I live in Turkey. I live in Florida, right? And I had to tell them, sorry, this, is, this class is only for enrolled students at my university. And, you know, they were disappointed by that. But I remembered all those messages after the class was done. And I thought, well, maybe there's an audience, right? Maybe there's a market of people who might be curious to read a book like this. So that kind of spurred me on to write the book that we are, of course, discussing today. <laughs> What was very funny is what makes this so risky for a history class, right, that you're tying it to this pop culture video game that those don't necessarily go together. I have to think the exact opposite is true when you make a book pitch for this because you've got a hook. You've got video games or big business. So a normal nonfiction book is a hard sell nowadays. I know a lot of nonfiction authors say it, but I think walking in there and saying, hey, I've already got a built-in audience for this. They must have been clamoring for you to get this book done. <laughs> yeah, no, it was fun. You know, I worked with a literary agent because you know I wanted this to be a commercial press book, not a university press book uh, like my first book had been. I was interested in kind of a press that could reach generalist readers, have the kind of budget and capacity and, and marketing wing to do this. Uh, but yeah, I was really thrilled to sign a contract with St. Martin's Press, which is part of Macmillan. And it's been a total joy uh, working with them. But yeah, they were really excited. You know, they were enthusiastic about, you know, making serious history relevant and engaging to gamers and, and just, you know, people who like history and video games together. Well, I mean, let's just jump into the book slash video game. I totally agree with you because we, we talked about this, you know, when we were setting this up, that I was going to go back into the game just to kind of refresh myself because I haven't played in years. I had already read the book. And as I'm walking through the game, I'm sitting there saying, all right, if I didn't already know everything that Tori wrote, when would this have clicked in my head about how good the history was? And I totally agree. The answer is Rhodes, right? It's supposed to be this kind of quintessential southern town post-Civil War. You come into it and there's a Confederate soldier statue. And that kind of hits you in the face. What I will say, going back to it, is... Especially the first time I did not pick up on how the Vanderlyn gang was set up from a racial perspective. And then I'll just say it, I'm not going to come down on either side of it, but there's a lot of questions nowadays about people, you know, forcing political views into something. But for this video game, we're talking about this coming out years ago. And it was very thoughtfully put together who is in this game and if this person is black, if this person is part American Indian, how they're going to be reacted to within the game. Because the main character is white, but he will go out with various people in his gang. And that's what really struck me once I was went back was how the game responds to who you're with in a thoughtful way that if you were in a quintessential southern town and you're with your black gang mate, it's going to be a bit more tense than if you're just two white guys walking around. Did that jump out at you when you were playing? Yeah, absolutely. No, it was one of the key things that made me want to teach the class and write the book, to be honest, because the game nicely captures the tremendous diversity of the United States in 1899. I mean, yes, you're right. The lead character, Arthur Morgan or John Marston is a white man, but all sorts of folks who surround him is his gangmates, the people he meets in the world, are people of color, women, immigrants, working class people. There is just a huge uh, stew of humanity captured in that game, which is entirely realistic uh, when it comes to what the United States looked like at that time period. In fact, I mean, the African-American population of the U.S., the proportion was higher in 1899 than it is today. So, yes, there would have been a lot of black people around, right, in the game captures that in in Saint Denis, in Le Moyne, and other parts of the game, right? So that's that's really important. You mentioned sort of you know forcing representation upon a period. Does the game do that or not? Well, I thought about this a little bit because I think that the one outlaw gang that was probably the closest inspiration for the Vanderland gang 
most likely has to be Butch Cassidy and his hole in the wall gang because, you know, the timing is so close. They have this ma massive train robbery in 1899. They get pursued by this railroad baron. He sicks the Pinkertons on them. They get chased into Latin America. There's so many parallels between Butch Cassidy and the Vanderlyn gang. But Butch Cassidy's gang was composed entirely of English speaking white men. <laughs> right. So if they're following trying to make that gang the sort of uh, archetype, then Rockstar did make it a lot more diverse than that gang had been, which is great, though. Like, I really appreciate that because by including a diverse cast of characters, by having lots of female actors and, and characters and black and Latino and native uh, peoples in it, the game is able to speak to some of the big social and political and economic dilemmas of the day, right? Which race was very powerful in shaping. I mean, this is not too far from the Civil War. The United States is still debating uh, many of these questions. Um, white supremacy was institutionalized in many elements of society. So the game really succeeds in capturing some of that. Could they have gone further? Of course, yeah, they could have done much more to place it at center stage. But given that the, the game came out in 2018, you know, which was, you know, five, six years ago at this point, before Black Lives Matter kind of changed a lot of the conversation in corporate America. I think it's pretty admirable that Rockstar uh, depicted such a diverse cadre of outlaws in the game. Now, I will say for the listeners to no, not everyone white in it is racist or anything like that. It's part of the story, but it's not the only story yeah. because, as you said, you can play for hundreds of hours and not actually get through the entire thing. I mean, this is a gigantic open world. My fiance saw it for the first time and is just like, wait, so a snake can come up and just bite you and you die? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> like, y you have to eat, otherwise you die. Like, what, what other games are you have to remember to eat and sit down and sit by the fire? One of the things that Red Dead 2 does so well as a video game is it combines so many genres, right? It has a survivalist instinct of course it's a third person shooter it kind of feels like an rpg ish at times there's just so many sort of you know it, it kind of blends the best of many uh, video game uh, genres but i mean ultimately to me it felt like an interactive movie like an interactive hbo show that's like 100 hours long <laughs> so let's just jump to one of the big questions what's your absolute favorite portion favorite part what's number one for you can you pick one i really love the time the gang spends in saint denis this clearly fictionalized New Orleans. It's the only big city in the game, and it's such a fascinating place to think through Southern history at this really pivotal moment of the 1890s. Uh, and the 1890s is a moment in Southern history that gets overshadowed by the kind of other big decades that people usually think of when they think about Southern history, the 1860s with the Civil War, the 1960s with Civil Rights Movement, but the 1890s, I would actually place as like the third most important decade in the modern history of the South, because it's in that moment that Jim Crow legislation, this legalized segregation, is first put into place. Uh, it's at that moment when many black and white voters are scrubbed from the rolls and the South has made this much less democratic place. It's at that moment that the Confederate battle flag surges into visibility. Uh, it's at that moment that statues to the Confederacy begin popping up left and right. They really had not been seen before that. So there's all this kind of change happening in the South at that moment. And using the gang's adventures in Saint Denis is a really exciting way to explore some of those big transitional moments in Southern history. Like many of them which are grim and dark and nasty, to be sure. And some of which the game speaks to and some of which the game does not. But to me, it was just an amazing think piece. Uh, and it's just such a beautifully designed city, too. You know, like I really think that a Red Dead 2's Saint Denis uh, rivals any other big city that uh, Rockstar has designed first. And of course, you know, Rockstar is famous for gamifying American urban culture through the GTA games. I would play Saint Denis up there, uh, you know, alongside their, their other fictional renditions of American cities. I have to say, when I was playing again, Valentine is probably still my favorite. It's the first town you go to. It's, it's just kind of a quintessential Old West town. It made me think about, which is something like we think of the Old West, but I don't think we think about what it was like out there, where you head out into the prairie and you might be the only family for miles upon miles. 
And you don't think about the fact, and this will happen in the game, all of a sudden outlaws will show up and start shooting up a house. And Valentine really made me feel how it's wide open but also isolated when we talk about the Old West, that you could go for miles and not see anyone. And then there'd be this little town, but it's not a huge town like Tombstone in the movies. It could just be a few houses here, a few houses here. Here's Main Street, which is, you know, a quarter of a block that we would see today. And this is all you have for miles upon miles. Yeah, though you could argue that that's true for the West today as well. It's still <laughs> quite sparsely populated, and there's a lot of distance separating people in you know states like Montana or Nevada or a place like that. Uh, but yeah, no, I remember very well walking into Valentine as well. You know, it's the first sort of semi-urban space that you get into with the gang. You know, I told you I was a sucker for graphics and design. And wow, I was just blown away when I saw this sort of small cityscape of Valentine. And I think this gets at one of the things that Rockstar did very best with this game in that they really do a nice job of capturing the visual landscape of turn of the century America. I have no doubt in my mind that they studied closely photographs from the period and sought to recreate them on the digital screen, that they really thought about the aesthetics, like the architecture, the street layout, the uh, typefaces in the newspapers and the mail order catalogs, <laughs> that sort of thing. I think when it comes to skin deep representations, you know, like they had this diverse stew of humanity, right? And then they have this visually very realistic and, and accurate uh, depiction of the, of the landscape and the cities and the farmland and the mountains and all that. On aesthetic terms, the game does really, really well. Now, of course, we know that that itself is not representing history. You know, like you can see a picture of a place that doesn't mean you understand it. Uh, so, of course, I spent a lot of time in my class and in the book thinking not just about the visual look of the past, but this sort of cultural fabric of the day, the social landscape. Like, what do people care about? What are the institutions that shape their lives? What do they think about? What do they see the possibilities in their lives like? You don't get that from a photograph. And on that count, the game is not quite as good <laughs> as at capturing the, the visual uh, landscape. But again, I got to give uh, kudos to Rockstar for nailing, you know, like those, those Saint Denis avenues with the trolley cars and the early electric lighting and the telegraph wires. Like that's spot on. You know, you look at photos from the Library of Congress, for example, of turn of the century New Orleans. It looks really similar to Saint Denis. We talked about the good part. By the way, this is just very, very clear in the book. So, of course, I know what the answer is. Which section of the game do you think is pretty close to a travesty? <laughs> yeah. So, first off, I'll note that my book is not a teardown of the game. You know, I love playing this game. And yeah, it has historical problems. But I don't spend the entirety of the book, you know, gouging the game for what it gets wrong. I'd look at the game quite sympathetically in many ways, but sometimes as a historian, I do have to be like, okay, well, come on now. <laughs> <laughs> to me, to me, the thing that's like really sticks out in your face most uh, with it regarding the sort of, you know, distortion of the past has to do with the levels of violence. I saw one video game website actually counted up like the number of people that Arthur Morgan would kill under an honorable playthrough, like the minimum number. It was 900, right? So that's a tremendously tall pile of bodies. In reality, there were only a handful of outlaws who even killed 10 people, right? So 900 is so bizarrely out of whack, uh, to be clear. And I mean, was, the game does nail the question that, you know, the United States, or at least certain portions of it, were violent, unusually violent at that moment. But one of the other big things that the game misses out on is what caused that violence. Because in the game, most of the violence that takes place on the screen is usually personal or random. Like it's it's motivated by grudges. It's motivated by the individual pursuit of wealth, right? Through robberies and holdups and that sort of thing. Whiskey, you know, overabundance of whiskey. Uh, those are the kinds of things that usually kind of trigger violence in the game. And that's not unlike most Westerns that have been made in the last 60, 70 years. But one of the big things I try to prove in my book uh, and illustrate is that when bullets flew in the West or the South or in Appalachia of the 1880s, 1890s, Usually it was tied up with big social and political problems. It had to do with things like capitalism. It had to do with things like race and inequalities of race. Uh, the game gestures to this once in a while. You know, you got this robber baron, Leviticus Cornwall, kind of bringing corporate capitalism to the West uh, and South. But 
it's usually at the sidelines, right? The kind of social and political questions are not at center stage. And that's another big critique I have of the game is that there's two institutions that are almost entirely absent from the game, but would have dominated people's lives at the time. One of them is party politics, right? Like no one has political identity in Red Dead 2. In fact, Arthur Morgan even says, I think politics is stupid. You know, who would ever want to vote? That's a dumb idea. There are no Republicans and no Democrats. And of course, I understand that Rockstar wants to be careful and, you know, avoid a live wire contemporary political debates. But you have to understand that in the 1890s, politics was so dominant in people's lives. The voter turnout at that time was significantly higher than it is today. And of course, we live in a very politically charged moment ourselves. So like trying to imagine the 1890s without like partisan affiliations is like trying to understand America today without, you know, the the divisions that we know all too well around us. So that's one kind of like pink elephant in the room that the game totally misses out on. And then the other pink elephant is the labor movement, the quest of workers to unionize and uh, get better wages and working conditions and all that. This is a movement that's really coming to a crescendo in the late 1800s, something that had only kind of been a towering issue since about the Civil War or so, but was the political question of the day. Like everyone had a strong viewpoint. (laughs) There were very, it was hard to sit in the middle on debates about labor and corporate capitalism. And the game only very briefly touches upon this. I think there's this one, as I've counted, one single reference to labor unions in the game right near the death of Leviticus Cornwall toward the the end of the game. But it's like three seconds, (laughs) you know, to go 100 hours and and hear about the labor movement three seconds is kind of hilarious. But again, I think I understand why Rockstar might have avoided it. They're also a big company themselves who probably has their own labor issues that they're working through. So if they make this an aggressively pro-union game, well, I don't know, that's opening a can of worms. Now, one of the things I know they got in quite a few places is the suffrage movement, which I should say in Sandini, by mistake, I shot a suffragette. It was, I pressed the wrong button. It happens, people. Trust me, if you play it, there's a lot of buttons. Sometimes you shoot people by mistake. Uh, There is quite a bit of that in there, almost shockingly based upon everything you just said, right? That they kind of don't want to just completely destroy the gamer with uh, going into these types of things. What is the suffrage movement around this time, 1899, where it's supposedly set? What does that look like? Well, yeah, great question. So first off, I'll make clear for everyone that the game never incentivizes you to shoot suffragettes or suffragists, right? Yeah, no, I was in huge trouble for it. The police came right after me as they should have. I raised this because there was this really toxic and nasty video that came out at around the time when Red Dead 2 was released showing someone intentionally beating feminists, suffragists in the game. And because of this really nasty troll video on YouTube, a lot of people who don't play video games assumed, oh, Rockstar made a game. The point is to, you know, to beat up suffragists. But that is definitely not true. Right? The game presents the women's suffrage movement in very positive and sympathetic light. It actually integrates it into the central part of the story. This is not just a side mission. You All players have to go through this. Uh, and that was another one of these moments early on playing that convinced me, oh, wow, this game is thoughtful. This game can be used in a classroom. So I think they, they treat it quite thoughtfully in, in many ways. And so how, how does that pop up, right? So, you know, this takes place in 1899. This is before, you know, a major federal amendment has brought women's voting rights. That only comes about 20 years later. In 1899, the movement had made significant gains, but mainly in the West. I mean, Western states like Wyoming and uh, Utah and Washington state had actually passed locally within their states uh, uh, effective women's suffrage. But the East was the real holdout. The East was strongly opposed. Uh, Eastern men, both in the North and in the South, were pretty firmly opposed. Uh, And this was the kind of uphill battle that many suffragists were fighting by the 1880s and 1890s. So I thought it was especially interesting that the game decided to set its women's suffrage march in uh, Lemoyne, in the southern state, in, in Rhodes, this kind of small plantation town, because if they had set it in like, you know, Valentine, that actually would have been unrealistic because it's likely that women already had the right to vote in Western states by 1899. But in a place like Mississippi or Louisiana, which, you know, I I think of as the inspiration behind Lemoyne, this was very much a live wire issue. And I think it's an intriguing moment, too, because it gets at the ways that Southern movement for women's suffrage 
lined up with some of those big changes in Southern history that I was just talking about, right? Because you remember that I mentioned that during the 1890s, you have massive campaigns of disfranchisement, of removing mainly black men uh, from voting. So a lot of uh, the Southern elites, you know, Beau Gray's cousins and uncles, the kind of folks, you know, are protesting against women's suffrage. They were anxious about women's suffrage, not just because they were anti-female misogynists, even though I'm sure they were that. They're also very anxious about bringing attention to the fact that they just disfranchised a whole lot of black men. They're very worried about the fact that the government would say that this is illegal, that they can't do this, which it was, right? It's totally unconstitutional. It's a violation of the 15th Amendment. So when like Beau Gray has this amazing line, he's, you know, he says to Arthur on this mission, he says, you know, he's trying to explain to Arthur why his family is so opposed to women's suffrage. And he says, you know, around here, they don't even like men voting. <laughs> and it's said as kind of like offhanded joke, but it is true that at that moment, Southern states were very much stripping black men from the voting rolls at the very same time that women's suffrage is becoming a big issue. So these things are all entangled. Does the game get at that? No, not really. But it provides me enough kind of hooks and one-liners to use it in a classroom to discuss the sort of intricacies of uh, race and gender and politics at that moment. You know, that's why I love the game. Yeah, but especially when we're talking about disenfranchisement, I'm sure everybody realizes Jim Crow. A lot of poor white men also lost the vote. It, it was... For the people who were, you know, running these political campaigns against this, they wanted to take a lot of people out of the voting rolls. I should be fair. Let me ask this real quick question just to clarify something you said before. So there were Western states that gave women the vote much earlier. They did that because they were very forward thinking and huge feminists, right? They didn't have any ulterior motives, did they? <laughs> oh, they very much had ulterior motives. Uh, it's a very self-serving sort of agenda. Not, I can't say for every state, but like Wyoming, for example. Wyoming is not even a state. It's a territory in 1869. And it uh, gives the vote to to women. And part of the rationale was there were barely any women in Wyoming in 1869. They desperately wanted to attract female settlers. You know, it's like this booming mining and ranching state where you have a lot of unaffiliated men showing up. And they thought that it would bring women if they had rights there that they didn't have back in New York or Virginia or a place like that. So, yeah, <laughs> there were some uh, shameless sort of motivating factors behind uh, these Western states trying to recruit women through the vote. Now, we've talked about a lot of stuff that stands in for real-life towns, situations. There is one group in this game that is directly attributed to a group that did exist. Tell me a little about the Pinkertons in this game and in reality. Yeah, this was one of the strange things about the game in that they fictionalized the names of almost everything. Right. I mean, there's clear moments of inspiration, right? Saint Denis, New Orleans, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, you know, the his gang, uh, the Wapiti and the Lakota Sioux, but they, they're fictionalized, but not the Pinkertons, right? Like the Pinkertons are this one thing that somehow escaped the fictionalizing brush of the writers and developers of this game, which actually led to some interesting drama in that the modern day 21st century Pinkerton agency, which, yes, still exists, sued Rockstar's parent company, Take-Two Interactive, saying that they were, you know, shaming and tarring and feathering their reputation, that they were smearing their reputation with this inaccurate portrayal. The case never went anywhere. It, it disappeared, um, uh, in part because I think the game does do a fairly accurate job of representing the Pinkertons, though the timing is kind of off. Right? So the game does portray the agency as these kind of stooges, mercenaries, hired guns of big business, of corporate capitalism, folks like Leviticus Cornwall. That is very much true by the 1890s. But by the 1890s, the Pinkertons had earned that reputation mainly by crushing labor unions, by crushing strikes. By the 1890s, the Pinkertons are really closely associated with urban labor unrest, things like the Homestead Strike of 1892. And in fact, very little of their budget was devoted to chasing outlaws during the 1890s. That's something that they'd done back in the 1870s, back when the original founder, Alan Pinkerton, was still alive. And yes, they had chased the Jesse James and his gang in a place like Missouri, but that actually hadn't made them unpopular. That had made them very popular. That had brought them a lot of acclaim and fame. 
as they, you know, served as these, you know, uh, lawmen, these unofficial lawmen of the West. But by the 1890s, the Pinkertons are very much a sort of, they're about industrial capitalism above all and the ways that that manifested at, uh, at, at strikes. If you could go back and make Rockstar change something in the game, we're going to keep the violence, okay? The violence is fun. It's a stress relief. Not the violence against suffragettes. That was, I pressed the wrong button, everybody. I was literally trying to give her money, and I pressed the wrong button. Don't send me emails about that. If you could change one thing besides the violence, what would you have Rockstar change about the game? The single easiest fix, though, that I could actually say is literally just by changing two numbers <laughs> they should change the game and set it in 1872 rather than 1899 because red dead 2 is a great game about the early 1870s and it's sometimes a very nonsensical game about 1899 because so many of the subjects that it speaks to we already talked about the pinkertons right so many of the subjects it speaks to were impossible in 1899 but would have been totally viable in 1871 right like going to hunt bison on the great plains uh, open warfare between native tribes and the U.S. Army. That's not happening in 1899, but it very much is happening in 1871. For example, the Ku Klux Klan doesn't exist in 1899. Very active in 1871. So like the game, if they just change that splash screen text to say not America 1899, but America 1871, the historical accuracy of the game would like go through the roof. <laughs> I mean, that's a good thing. The uh, KKK section, did you uh, let them burn or did you just run in their guns blazing? I had three different playthroughs, so I got to experience each of the following. But yes, first playthrough, guns blazing. You know, I have a lot of historical grudges against the Ku Klux Klan. So to be able to enact those in violence on the screen, I couldn't uh, resist that temptation. <laughs> well, Tori, there are people who are kind of like, video games, I don't play video games. History, history is boring. This book isn't for me. I like just straight up fiction. You and I both know these people are just, they just don't understand. So if I sat one of those people in front of you and they said, why should I read Red Dead's history? What would you say to them? Yeah, I really want to reach people who don't read history otherwise with this book. And perhaps video games can be the wedge into that. I don't know. But I think most people who are sour on history is because they had uninspiring teachers, usually at the middle and high school level. It got drilled into them that history is nothing but an accumulation of facts and dates that they need to memorize. And history is nothing but a list of presidents and wars, right? especially for American history. And that is so far from the truth that it's laughable. And I don't teach in any way like this. And Red Dead's history is not at all written uh, in that sort of way. History is this living, breathing thing, right? Like our understanding of it is changing every single year. What happened isn't changing. That's set in stone. But our understanding of what it means and why it happened is constantly evolving. I mean, historians' understanding of U.S. history is so different today than it was 50 or 100 years ago, to be sure. And in many ways, history is so fascinating because it's just you take the complexity and nuance and irony of our lives, which we all live around, you know, and then we see that it was just as complex and nuanced and ironic back then, uh, whether it was 1899 or 1799 or anything like it. Right. The same sorts of nuances and intricacies that mark the world we live in, they're all there in the past. You know, we have this instinct to flatten and sterilize the past, you know, to reduce it to nostalgia or to myth. And that sucks a lot of that nuance and complexity out of it. And once you see the past for what it was for this messy, wild thing, it becomes a whole lot more interesting. Right. It doesn't look like a list of names and dates and wars and presidents anymore at that point. So hopefully in this book, use this beloved game as a way to open some of those conversations about that fascinating and intricate past that I know from years of study. Well, Tori, I think you nailed it. The book is fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on to talk about it. Hey, thank you, Brendan. It's been such a pleasure to chat. And that's it for this episode. Tori, thank you so much. Red Dead's history, great book, great game. Go out and get yourself both. It's going to keep you entertained for so long. Hit us up. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. You know the deal. I do this every time. YouTube. Don't forget about that. Send us comments. Send us emails. We appreciate everything. Until next time, nerds, stay cool. History Nerds United.